So um, position and rank is associate professor of history. Uh, I've been at GCC for just over 10 years now. I chose history as a profession and, and teaching kind of as a subset of, of that, largely because I, I think that we live in a society that, that doesn't appreciate history enough. I think that young people really need it to have a context for understanding the world. I think that a better appreciation of history teaches us a lot about ourselves and about culture. Of course, over the years, I think that my motivations have changed and my outlook in philosophy has, has changed a bit. I have never more appreciated teaching than during the pandemic when I missed it. The Zoom is just not the same. I, I may do, but um, being face to face with my students is something I'm really looking forward to when we come back. Well, Helmira was, was not a project that was on my radar. It was something that I was approached with by Chris Mikowski, the editor of the Emerging Civil War series. And he asked me to write this book. I think he asked me because he knew that I grew up only 30 miles from Elmira. And he knew I had an interest in the POW camp in Elmira because of a number of blog posts I wrote for the Emerging Civil War blog series. I was actually working on an entirely different project about William Tecumseh Sherman. I had to kind of put that aside to do this book. I was happy to do it. I mean, the, it's something that I think there's, o- there's only a handful of books about Helmira. It was something that I felt that, you know, an introductory volume that was relatively short and easy for people to read and access was something that was desperately needed. I had personal motivation too. You know, my third great grandfather served in the Civil War. His name was William Reese. And uh, he fought at the Battle of Gettysburg, was wounded on the first day, and was transferred to something called the um, Invalid Corps or the Veterans Reserve Corps. And I found out through research that he served in Elmira the last months of the war. And so that makes the whole thing much more personal. So this is a prisoner of war camp that existed only for a year in Elmira, New York. It held Confederate uh, POWs, largely from Robert E. Lee's army. A lot of these were kind of the backwash of the Overland Campaign of 1864. The last couple of years of the war, POW camps both North and South grew and grew and grew because the program of exchange of prisoners had broken down. And so Elmira was opened because of overflow capacity at places like the POW camp in uh, Maryland along the Eastern shore. Elmira was chosen because uh, from the very earliest days of the war, uh, it had been a station for recruits to be shunted through to the war, kind of a um, training ground for new recruits. This is where a lot of new volunteers for the war got their uh, original training. Elmira was a transportation hub. You know, it was on several major railroads. Uh, There was a major canal. And so it made a lot of sense to make use of Elmira for the war effort. And then in 64, the infrastructure was already there when they needed to create a new camp. And some of the land was already under lease by the federal government. And so this made sense to them. Though the location they chose, I think was very problematic because you know they built a palisade you know, 12 feet high, but the back of the palisade was right on the banks of the Shemung River. And while that wasn't a problem for a while, Come spring, when all the snow melted uh, on the hills surrounding the camp, the flooding that resulted wiped away 80% of the fence. So it probably wasn't a great idea from the start. I certainly was quite unaware of all that it would mean when I accepted the project. Writing the book, was the easy part as it turned out. You know, the research and the writing of the book actually went together pretty quickly. It was just everything else that I didn't know had to be done. Things like choosing the pictures and then getting permissions for the pictures and writing the captions for the pictures and revisions and edits and 
a strange system for footnoting that you know doesn't match any of the systems we're trained as scholars to use it was really annoying to me. After you get this this stuff done, then there's the long wait for the book to be published. And being my first book, I was somewhat impatient. And then, you know, just my luck, a month into the pandemic, after everything had shut down, that's when my book comes out. So that was really annoying. The kind of stuff that I like, doing book talks and getting out and seeing people could not be done. And uh, that kind of thing is only ramping up again now. I have book talks uh, scheduled. Uh, as a matter of fact, over the past three days, I've had like three different offers. So clearly it's on people's minds, largely at libraries right now. But that's, you know, I think that's a good sign. I have a, a new book coming out in the spring that you know, is in development at the moment. I'm hoping that that will be more of a normal release. This was the original project I was working on. It was, it's, a, it's a biography of William Tecumseh Sherman, who was a, a leading union general during the Civil War. This is a guy that I've been interested in for a long time, and I've been researching his life for probably at least 10 years. Tracy Ford and I toured in a play that I wrote featuring Sherman and Grant, and we had uh, 15 or 16 performances all over the East Coast. And so in, in writing the script for that play, that was also kind of part of my own preparation process, as it turned out. So that book it will be published also by Savas Beattie, uh, the publisher of Helmira. Well, I'm a professor of fine arts at uh, Genesee Community College. Since 2008, I absolutely love my job. Uh, the best part is working with the students. They're actually inspiring to me uh, every year, the new group of students. And I, I focus on drawing, painting, 2D design, and I uh, mentor majors as they work through their portfolio for, for graduation and moving on after GCC as well. Emma's for Mindful was a great collaboration between me and the author, Robin Flanagan. And it, I, I was excited about her, her manuscript because uh, I just saw so much potential in her words. And it, it, right at the beginning, I think it, it just looked like a lot of fun to illustrate, you know, to, and she was also open for me to paint all of the pages. Um, and so, and I was excited about that as well. So it was just a great collaboration from the start. And in the book itself, uh, we would brainstorm back and forth between the two of us on the concepts of each letter, A through Z. I, and then I would, we'd focus on A, uh, we'd have that kind of collaboration, and then I would paint. And then we would move on to the next letter, and I would paint. And that went on for six months. Um, I did 52 acrylic paintings to illustrate the book in that process. So it was very creative and there was a lot of um, back and forth and play actually in the creation of the book. And I think that shows in the end result. Sure. So the publishing process, you know, after you get through the manuscript of the, the author writing the book and then the illustrator illustrating the book, uh, there's a whole other level there, uh, you know, where you piece together the design of the overall format of the book. We had a graphic designer work with us on the cover, for example, um, and then the page layouts on the interior with the text. I actually did do all of the layout design in the, in the book itself. Um, and then you know, and then getting it to publish, I think was pretty exciting the day that it popped up on Amazon. And we actually got that far to have the book in one piece fully evolved and finished uh, so that people could, could pick it up. That was a pretty exciting day. We actually started a small business, uh, the two of us, and we also brought in a director of marketing and we started a business called Mindful Kids Thrive inspired by the Emma's for Mindful book. And we actually have, um, this past year, I made a coloring book for kids that's based off of the Emma's for Mindful book. Um, we did a creativity journal 
and uh, we have a, a brain science book coming soon. So we are working on educational supplements for teachers to pick up the M is for Mindful book and then also have some teaching tools to use in the uh, pre-K K classrooms. I just love the one-on-one -on -one interaction and uh, with students and I love uh, being able to make a difference and being able to not only connect with them because I've always thought um, college, particularly undergraduate years are just such an exciting time of life when, you know, students are full of uh, excitement and hope and dreams and, you know, they're not too cynical yet, like all of the older people tend to get and, you know, you're just in a position where you can really inspire and empower. As I said, it pertains to advocacy and self-advocacy, but I've always thought um, when I was a student and I recall the professor would say at the end of the lecture, any questions? And I always remember, and even to this day, you know, over 30 years ago, there was always like a deafening silence in the room. And I remember thinking in my mind, there's no way there are no questions. Just people aren't um, equipped to, to ask them for whatever reason. Maybe they're too reserved or they're afraid they'll be embarrassed, um, whatever the case. And then lo and behold, years later, when I was on the other side of the aisle, as the um, professor um, asking the same thing, I'd get the same response. And at first I was a little naive and I thought, well, I guess my lectures were crystal clear and uh, you know, nobody has any questions, but of course I, I couldn't have been more wrong. I wrote about this in my introduction. So that uh, for whatever reason always resonated with me and it always stuck with me. And I always thought, um, what a great idea to write a book about the importance of advocating for yourself and, um, and the benefits of that. And I've also thought about, um, and I talk about this as well in my book, um, what happens if you don't advocate for yourself? You know, what's the result of that? You know, what, um, where does that lead you? So that's always been an interesting topic. And I've also thought a lot about students' rights and um, how important it is to not only familiarize yourself with what they are, but also to be able to interpret things like the student code of conduct and be able to advocate in that regard. Um, and when you think of, at least from my perspective, student codes of conduct, um, to me, they're just chock full of these legalese that, you know, I, I compare it in my book to the iPhone, Apple iPhone disclaimer. You know, nobody ever really reads that. And if they do, you know, they're overwhelmed. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice to just take all that complicated legalese and simplify it into layman's terms? So that anybody, you don't have to be a legal scholar, any you know, average student can understand it. So that was another motivation behind the topic. And, um, and I've also included a section for parents, because I think that's um, so, so important. You know, if you have a, uh, maybe your son or daughter is a high school student and they're on their way to college, what's your role? What's the right way to, what's the best way rather to advocate for them? So I've kind of um, taken those three ideas and um, rolled them into, into the book. When I sat down to uh, develop the outline with my publisher, my, my target audience was, of course, um, you know, either high school seniors or college students, um, and in particular, even college students who are maybe more on the introverted side, who aren't accustomed to maybe their first generation, even college students would be ideal. But um, having written the book, and um, reflected on it for a while. I really think um, you can spend a lifetime honing your advocacy skills. So I think it's applicable to people from all walks of life. It's, on, it's called, If You Don't Ask, The Answer Is No, um, a practical guide for getting through college without falling through the cracks. I've had this topic in my head for many, many years, um, the topic of advocacy and self-advocacy. I've always thought that it was uh, just a very undervalued and underrated topic. But one day I just decided um, it ain't doing any good just sitting up in my head. I need to share this with the world. So I was fortunate enough to connect with a uh, publisher up in Canada. It's called uh, Live Life Happy Publishing, LLH, in uh, Caledon. And uh, she focuses primarily on, um, I guess you would call it the self-help genre and um, related books. So it was a good fit for me. Um, you know, we had several meetings over the course of uh, several months, uh, hashing out ideas 
related to my topic and uh, coming up with a blueprint and an outline. And um, I really, really learned a lot about uh, not only the inner workings of publishing, having gone through this project, um, but also the marketing aspect and uh, even the editing and just um, really what it takes to get a book from the conceptual phase uh, to the shelves and to the screen and, you know, to see a project through to um, from beginning to end uh, was a wonderful learning experience for me. And uh, editing, by the way, is very humbling. You know, you may think you're Charles Dickens, but then you get your work in front of an editor and uh, you realize you have a lot to learn. I have worked at GCC in, in just a part-time capacity for a long time probably 15, 16 years. When I was a full-time teacher at Kendall, I used to teach 11th and 12th grade. I, I decided I wanted to um, also have um, an evening position and was offered um, a, few, a few courses here and there at GCC. And I've continued with that. Sometimes I go a semester without teaching whether it be numbers on their part or something going on in my life, but it's been a really wonderful experience. And I've always, um, I've always enjoyed it. It's, it's different from teaching high school. And yeah, I, I love teaching and it's been nice since I've pulled away from full-time teaching at the secondary level. It's been nice to keep this college class in my life. I've been able to make a, a living with my writing. And so I, I haven't had to teach full time, but I don't think I'd ever really want to give up teaching. It's just, um, it's a, something that I've really enjoyed doing. My, my first book, the, the Beloved Wild is historical. It's historical YA. And it's about a young girl living in New England who discovers her brother is going to be pioneering to the Genesee Valley. And this was the early 1800s. So at that time, the Genesee Valley was the Wild West. This brother also happens to be her best friend. And so there's a sense of impending loss in that regard. But she also has many circumstances in her current place in New England that are troubling her, one of which is some pressure from her family to marry someone that she doesn't really know that she wants to marry. So she ends up um, accompanying her brother, Gid, and um, unbeknownst to him, she, she makes this decision as they're on the journey so that he can't change his mind about letting her come with him. She decides to, to go as a boy. She decides to masquerade as a young man, cognizant of the kind of freedom that will give her when she's in this, in this new land to kind of live life in a way that she was never allowed to do so before. It's an adventure story. It's, you know, obviously a, a pioneer story and it was a lot of fun to research. It was really a joy to research this area specifically and find out about um, how it was settled and the trials and tribulations that the early pioneers faced coming into this area. I switched modes entirely and did a contemporary novel um, next. This one is called Unleaving. And this is a story about a young woman who, after experiencing a sexual assault at college and um, working really hard to hold the, the boys involved accountable, faces a kind of backlash and decides to take a leave of absence from school. The school permitted her to leave and she goes to live with her aunt who lives in a cabin on Lake Ontario and her aunt is an artist. And a lot of it is about her dealing with that experience and trying to move on, looking at trauma in, in a very specific way with sexual assault, but also looking at how trauma sometimes is magnified by things like victim shaming and you know blame that really is ill-placed so she she's a character who you know i kind of follow her journey to recovery and to moving on and also going back she um 
has to make that decision whether or not she should go back to college. And this was a very emotional work for me to write. And um, like I said, it's very different from my debut, but also one that really got me thinking and, and helped me learn a lot as I was working on it. I started writing regularly when my first child came along um, some 12 years ago. I had always dabbled in writing and even had a, a concentration in creative writing in college. But with teaching full time, it was something that definitely took the back burner. And once I, I decided to leave teaching full time and, and started raising my kids, I got back into writing and for a long time it was just kind of a secret pleasure and working on projects but eventually I, I thought about trying to get my work out there and I and I did query agents with the first book of a series of YA novels and I was not successful in finding an agent through that and with traditional publishing you really need an agent it's very difficult to sell a book without an agent. Um, so I set that series aside and I wrote another book and eventually I queried that one too. This was a contemporary women's fiction piece and that one also I did not have success um, finding an agent. And then I wrote another work of content contemporary women fiction and again was unsuccessful <laughs> and so when I when I finally went back to YA and wrote The Beloved Wild I really entered the querying process with no expectations you know it's just so hard they talk about the oh, what do they call the sludge pile you know that you you send a query to an agent and it just is one of maybe 200 that they get in a day I didn't have any connections in publishing. I got a book, How to Write a Query Letter, just to figure out you know, what I was doing. I was teaching myself everything about the process. And then for some reason, The Beloved Wild right away garnered a lot of interest from agents. It was kind of bizarre to go from you know, failure, failure, failure for years and all of a sudden have um, you know, three different agents expressing interest in it. So I really was lucky in that regard. The agent I went with, she's actually no longer my agent. I, I have a new agent now because she got out of the agent, agent field. But I'm so glad that I had her as my first agent because she's wonderful. Rebecca Stead, she's a Newbery award-winning author. I really benefited from her guidance, not just in terms of the publishing industry, but in terms of writing. She's, you know, being such a fabulous writer herself, she really helped me grow as a writer. And that was such a joyful experience. I love, I love agent I have now. So, you know, I, I am lucky that I've been able to work with two agents so far. Rebecca helped me land a two book deal with McMillan. I was very lucky to work with Liz Zabla, the um, editor at one of the children's divisions of McMillan. And yeah, it was just, you know, boom, boom, those two novels came out. In the meantime, I've been writing a lot of short fiction and have, I've been lucky to get a lot of short stories placed in different journals and literary magazines. And a few of them have been put in anthologies. So that's been exciting. I have one that's in my agent's hands right now. So we'll see, we'll see what happens with that. It's a, it's a tough field. Um, a lot of it is timing. You know, when I think about the success I found with The Beloved Wild, I think a lot of it has to do with what that novel was about and maybe what was going on in our world and, and how it maybe satisfied some readerly desire that publishers and agents were, were identifying. Probably would have been better served had I focused on short story writing and publishing before I just jumped straight to um, novel writing. So I'm sure one of the deterrents for agents in looking at my query letter was recognizing that I didn't mention an MFA and I couldn't mention any previous publication. You know, that would have been something that I should have done differently. And maybe people who are starting off just there's so many wonderful journals out there and so many ways that you can get published.
that aren't necessarily just getting the book out there. So I'm the coordinator of tutoring and academic support, which means that we help every single GCC student um, who walks through our doors. And we help with everything from academic tutoring, specific academic disciplines, to writing help, to building success skills. So things like time management and study skills, uh, all of those success skills that students need to develop in order to be successful students. I really enjoy my position and my work here. I really see myself as an educator and my staff as educators, even though we're not in a traditional classroom. And I love to see the students who come in who have aced a test or have completed a class with a grade that they didn't expect. Uh, that's one of my favorite parts is when students come back and report their great work to us. And um, even sometimes faculty will check in with us and say, you know, you're, you've worked with this student and we've seen them improve so much. And so that uh, is just something I really enjoy doing here at GCC. I'm gonna start with Campus Sonar. Campus Sonar is, um, an educational technology group that they look at what they call social listening. And so they help campuses or institutions or systems look at what people are saying and acting and behaving on social media, specifically certain parts of social media like Reddit um, or Twitter that students or community members are talking about institutions. And so they call that social listening because they help institutions listen to what people are saying about them um, online. And they released an annual report that I was reading through and I was chatting with the CEO and founder of Campus Center. And I said, you know, this really sounds like something in the student affairs world called educational ethos. And that is in the student affairs uh, genre and discipline is when we understand what other people are saying about us and our culture formed by that. And so I had a really great conversation with Dr. Liz Gross, who's the CEO and, and founder of Campus Sonar. And she asked me to write this blog post incorporating some theoretical and research um, analysis on campus ethos. And so that is where I started. And I dug into some campus ethos uh, research along with some theoretical foundations and put that all together in a single blog post. Uh, the original thought was that if it's really more dr like drawn out, if there are a lot of different pieces, it could be a series of blog posts, but it wound up just being a really nice single piece that they published. Um, and, and now I'm there on their website and I'm a contributor. So the publishing process was something I have never really encountered before. So I was asked to put this piece together after a conversation. And it really started with bouncing some ideas, like an, a basic outline back and forth with one of their editors. And it was very much a collaborative process, which I've never really experienced before. I've always written in more of an academic setting where you submit something and you get feedback and that's just kind of the end of the process. And so this was really iterative and creative. And so um, we worked together and as things grew, um, I added things or I had to take things away. We had embedded links and then we didn't have embedded links. And we really wanted to make sure that if people wanted to dig into the literature that we used accessible pieces that were either open access or were just easy to read or find in a public library setting. And so we really wanted to focus on it being accessible to just the average reader. We didn't want it to have to be an academic piece that academics could only consume. And so that editing process took a little while, but uh, it was really interesting. And I, I really appreciated the collaborative nature of the editor that I worked with. For Campus Sonar, they really talked to campus professionals along with their marketing and communications teams, because that is who Campus Sonar works with primarily, along with cabinet members. And so what I was really writing for when I was working with the editor, what we were writing for is just something easy to read that a leader of a campus could read easily and consume easily, and then bring back to their campus and have a conversation about. And so it's really professionals who are working in campus marketing and communications, along with camp cabinet members and, you know, board of trustee members or whoever else is helping lead a campus. So I did recently contribute a chapter to um, a professional publication, um, NCLCA put out a special edition of their journal called TLAR. And I contributed a chapter about how we 
worked through the pandemic and all of the changes that we made in those first six to eight months and talked about that process and what that process looked like for us. Uh, and so that's available now. I have a, an electronic copy of that chapter if anyone would like to read it, but it's also available in both an ebook and a print book that you can find on Amazon. Um, I'm also currently a PhD student at Albany in their curriculum instruction program. So I do a lot of writing for that program. And right now I'm looking at putting a piece together for publication about the um, curriculum and how curriculum is really like nature and the ecology of curriculum and how curriculum is everything that we do in both a classroom in an institution and outside of our institution. So I talk about curriculum as if it's a garden, which is a really interesting piece uh, that, I, that I'm working on. Uh, I'm an adjunct uh, composition instructor. I've been, uh, this will be my ninth year, I think, doing that. I have primarily been out in Orleans County campuses, working both in Albion and Medina, uh, teaching and actually uh, I, was, I was the test proctor pre-COVID. This semester, however, I have uh, three classes uh, on the main campus. GCC is my alma mater uh, back in 1985, actually. As far as teaching, uh, teaching writing, uh, writing is something that I love to do. Uh, words, playing with the words and playing with phrases and just uh, creating emotion, uh, something that I, I love to do. And, I, and teaching writing to students who are just coming into college, I hope to be able to instill that, some of that into them at least, and show them that writing can be a positive thing. I like to teach them to think also. Uh, my writing classes are mostly about uh, thinking about what you're doing and what you're working on and all that kind of stuff. And it's just uh, a pleasure uh, that I didn't know before. Uh, teaching is new to me nine years ago, new to me. Watching them progress and seeing them mature through the college system, through the through the two years that they're with in, in, uh, uh, with GCC, uh, and you see them graduate and move on to and uh, what it is that they want to do. Uh, that's a real pleasure for me. Lost and Found is, is a story about a, a writer, <laughs> uh, a writer from this uh, area of the, of the country who, uh, when he was young, went to Florida, uh, wrote a couple of books, got a lot of success, uh, lived the good life for a bunch of years until the money ran out, uh, and his life just kind of fell apart down there. And then he returns uh, back to uh, this part of the world uh, and his uh, only living relative is aunt where and he discovers that there are some uh, uh, some things going on that just aren't right and when he looks into them uh, he discovers some criminal activity uh, and uh, helps to resolve all of that it's a mur it's a it's a whodunit kind of thing a murder mystery kind of thing so we've been working on this uh, idea oh god it's got to be 20 years now I went back to college in 2006, got my bachelor's and my master's, and the idea of writing was, that's, that's when I decided to really kind of pursue writing. And the ideas uh, for my book actually come from uh, my favorite authors uh, from a long, uh, from long time ago, uh, a guy named John D. McDonald, who wrote a series of a character called Travis McGee. Uh, there's 20 or so books of that. And uh, another guy, uh, Robert B. Parker, uh, who wrote uh, several different uh, characters uh, series. And they're just guys who, you know, find out that there's a problem. They're good guys who just find out that there's a problem and they go out and they try to fix it. I tried to model my story uh, and my character, uh, Arne Maxwell is his name, uh, around these kind of guys that uh, he's not really a detective kind of guy, but he sees a problem and he goes out and he tries to tries to resolve it in a way that uh, works out doesn't always work out, but <laughs> it works out for him, but it doesn't always work out for everybody else. For me, it was uh, the to be honest with you, the, the, the manuscript sat for a bunch of years uh, untended. Uh, I kind of wrote most of it. Um, while I was in college, and then I just kind of sat on it. I wasn't really, really that confident in it, I guess. And then one day I decided if I was going to be a writer, if I was going to publish something, I can't let it sit. So I worked it over a little bit. 
um, and I came across a, a company called uh, Atmosphere Press uh, out of Texas, and I submitted uh, to them, uh, among others, uh, uh, but they were interested. Ultimately, we uh, worked together to uh, to publish my book. I'm looking for anyone who just likes a good book to read. Uh, my, my hope is that I've created a good story. Uh, it's, I'm not looking to do anything other than, uh, quite honestly, entertain. Uh, it's something that a lot of people who have read it tell me that they've read it over the weekend or over a few days uh, that they couldn't put it down. Uh, which is kind of exciting uh, for a writer to hear that kind of thing. And so it's, um, my audience is uh, anyone who likes to read. Actually, I'm very active in the, in the marketing of the book. We are trying to get it out. I have a website uh, that uh, you, uh, cus potential customers can go to, a uh, Facebook page, Instagram page. I have several copies at home. I, I offer signed copies uh, to anyone who uh, wishes to buy one. We're looking to, uh, I'm looking to get out into, uh, as things open up, book readings and also uh, like small festivals or, or uh, markets, you know, uh, up in Brockport, they're having a peddler's market at the Morgan Manning House. Uh, I, I got a booth there. I'm going to try and get it out to anybody, anybody and everybody I can. <laughs> I'm actually working on two at the same time, two ideas uh, that I had. One. Uh, it's a sequel, a second uh, book uh, to follow up, Lost and Found, uh, more adventures of my character, Iron Maxwell, uh, as he uh, goes through life. Uh, but the other one is actually a historical novel, an idea that I got while I was in college. Um, and I've been developing that one since, uh, since college also. And they're both, let's say, in the early stages. It's going to be, uh, you know, four or five chapters in on each one. Uh, so they got a ways to go yet. Mm-hmm.